Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another exciting virtual tour with Pretty Gritty Tours. I am your host, Chris Stottinger, and thank you for joining us tonight. We are going to be exploring some of, but not all of, the exciting ghost towns here in Washington State, and I think we've got a good lineup for you guys tonight. Uh, as always, I encourage you guys to comment along. Uh, this is by far the most people we've had on a virtual tour, so I'm hoping that everything goes well. Uh, but if you have questions, comments, anything, please leave them in the comments below. This is truly a passion for me, and so getting to interact with all of you is one of my absolute favorite parts of this entire thing. Also, uh, because some people did ask, yes, uh, this is free and it will remain live on our website, our YouTube channel, and our Facebook page after we are done today. So if you aren't gonna get to see it right now, or if you tune out at some point, you can always come back and see it later. Uh, and in fact, if you would like to contribute to these tours, you can always tip your guide uh, right at prettygrittytours.com. Right there on the home page of our website, there is a PayPal button where if you enjoy your tour tonight, you can always tip, you don't have to, but I always appreciate it. So let's, uh, it looks like there's people from all over, not just the state of Washington, but the country today. So I'm hoping that we at least encounter one or two ghost towns you've never heard of before, and hopefully some that you've never been to and encouraging you to get out. Uh, I know there's a pandemic right now, but hey, they're ghost towns. You can go and there shouldn't be anybody there. Uh, let's, uh, let's dive in, shall we? I think when we're looking at ghost towns in the state of Washington, there's hundreds really that you could look at. There are some core ones that we're gonna talk about today, but basically any time that they found resources that looked good, a town popped up. And that gamble didn't always pay off. Sometimes things would tap out within one or two years, or sometimes the railroad wouldn't end up going to the direction that they thought it would, and people would get shoved out or their futures would disappear, which is kind of what happened with our first town tonight, Melmont. Now, Melmont, like so many of the ghost towns that we're going to talk about, was a mining town here in Washington. It is located right, uh, kind of, I hope you can see it on the map there, right by Mount Rainier National Park, and it was a coal mining town located just outside of Carbonado off of Highway 165 today, and is basically just on the outskirts of Mount Rainier National Park. It was founded in 1900, and at its peak, it had a hotel, a saloon, a butcher, a storehouse, a train depot, and houses for the workers. And what was interesting about it was that all of the homes were in rows and the workers self-segregated themselves by race. This continued as a mining operation for only about five years, really at its peak, and then vanished because they ran out of coal. Melmont uh, continues to have some of its structures out there today, but not, not the most. Some of the ghost towns we're gonna talk about tonight have basically everything left there untouched. If you're gonna go and explore it, when you park, you're gonna go underneath the trestle bridge off of Highway 165 here, down this trail, and the first thing you'll see is really the main remaining structure here, which is the dynamite shed. And during the, the like 12 to 16 years of really good operation that they had, 
before they decided to give up the ghost, so to speak. The dynamite shed was the main focus of this area because it's what they were using to blast into the Cascade Mountains to extract that coal. And at their peak, by the time they were said and done, 900,000 tons of coal have been extracted from Melmont here. By far, the biggest scandal to rock the town, figuratively and metaphorically, was in 1905 when Jack Wilson, the foreman of this camp, was in his home with his young daughter and somebody put several charges of dynamite underneath the home and tried to kill him and his daughter. Now, I don't know how it happened. I haven't been able to find the exact records, but both Jack and his daughter survived that incident, though it is very well documented that Jack was almost entirely deaf after that period. What's strange about it is that the crime never was solved after that. They never figured out who had done it, but it continued in the legacy of that time forever and always. Here are some photos of what Melmont looked like, and here you can see those homes being stretched out along the roads. And again, each line of these was for a different group of workers that came out to the area there. One of the foundations that remains is of this massive schoolhouse, by far the largest structure in Melmont during its peak was the, the two-story schoolhouse here. And today, just past these decrepit ruins of trucks that were left and abandoned there, is the foundation of the schoolhouse today. This is one of the few things that you can still see out there because the majority of the structures have been um, just eroded by the forest. The plants have come and reclaimed almost everything out there. When you go, because I hope that you do, this is the structure that you're going to want to look for the most. And it's, again, that dynamite shed out there. Now, this isn't a picture of Melmont. This is of the Bellingham Lumbered Yard. But I think it's important because a lot of the places that we're going to talk about tonight really hit their peak at the same time, 1890s to basically 1905. And they were looking for mines everywhere, chopping down trees anywhere they could, and then diverting all those resources to Olympia, Tacoma, Seattle, Bellingham and trying to create empires out of it. Each of these towns that sprung up thought that they were going to be the next big, big thing. But as you'll see tonight, so few of them managed to last more than 15 years. Of the remnants that are left behind, the spookiest and by far most dangerous are the mine shafts. This is from the Winlock coal mine appropriately in Winlock, Washington. We have a clip here from the YouTubers Pines and Mines who went inside this particular mine. I, under no circumstances, encourage or endorse people exploring abandoned mine shafts, but here's a clip of it so that you can see inside the Winlock mine. So head down the tunnel, there's this wooden trough on the ground. I haven't seen anything like that before. It only goes for about 20 feet. So just past that wooden trough on the ground and we've come to the second winds in this mine where the tunnel continues but the winds takes up the entire tunnel so they have these collars you can walk across but we're not going to walk across that because we don't want to fall in. For those of you who caught our Caves of Washington State virtual tour in the past there, you might recognize the color and clarity of the water down there. And all of that is uh, mineral rich water that seeps in through the local limestone and then fills into these cavities down there. Uh, again, incredibly dangerous, but um, there are people that done it, so you don't have to. If you find yourself in Winlock and you don't want to explore mines, you can go and see one of the greatest tourist attractions ever, I've been told. In Winlock, it is home to the world's largest egg. Uh, they once dubbed themselves the egg capital of the world back in 1923 when Winlock was producing thousands of eggs. And as a tribute to that economic prowess, they created here the world's largest egg sculpture. Uh, if, in case you're curious, it's 12 feet long and weighs 1,200 pounds. And if you find yourself driving through Winlock, uh, it is certainly one of the best things that you can view while you're down there. Nothing but encouragement today. When we're talking ghost towns though, I think of the ghost towns in Washington state, the best preserved is Molson, 
Molson, Washington. Uh, again, founded in 1900 by two guys, George Meacham and John B. Molson, the same guy who created Molson Beer. Uh, if you can see it on the map here, it's up in the Okanagan County there, and there is a tremendous cluster of ghost towns back to back there in remarkable preservation. And that's all due to the Okanagan County Historic Society. Um, and Molson is the best preserved of them. And it's because of the people that live there. So when you're going around Molson, it's an open air museum, essentially, year round access. You can go in at any time uh, and all of these buildings are unlocked and you can get a flavor for what it looked like at the time because not only is it full of the artifacts, but it's the original buildings. Uh, in particular, this one here from 1896, the Poland China Molson Gold Mines Assay Office. And some of the best structures in the area are actually homesteads or cabins. Uh, and in particular, the one that I'm most excited about is the Sherling cabin, uh, which ended up belonging to the Sherling family, as you might guess, but their son, Harry Sherling, was the sort of pioneer in every sense of the word, who really advocated for Molson to become a, a time capsule, to be a ghost town and to celebrate that. Uh, because once everyone drifted away after the mine dried up, there was sort of an idea of what they were gonna be able to do with it. And then things got worse for the people of Molson because the mine dried up, they didn't know what they were gonna do with it. And then in 1909, a farmer by the name of J.H. McDonald filed a homestead uh, petition, which included pretty much the entirety of Molson. And when he asked everyone to leave, they were like, absolutely not. So he put up eviction notices and forced everyone out of the town of Molson into what they called New Molson, which was just half a mile north of this. Uh, it wasn't appropriately incorporated though. And so just, I think six years after the incorporation of New Molson, it was disbanded by the Supreme Court of Washington and the ghost town legend continued. What's interesting about Molson is for the paranormal investigators out there, it's definitely one of the most active ghost towns out there. Uh, I've got a clip to show you guys here of Molson, which I want you to take a look at. So this footage is from this winter, and you can see all of the equipment that's left out there. And this is the Sherling family cabin. This is the original homestead of Harry Sherling, who was the main driving force between, between creating a museum and preserving their legacy here. Now it's the bank that we're inside right now that gets the most paranormal hits for people. Several of these paranormal investigation teams have gone out to the town of Molson and each of them independently has recorded feeling a presence or capturing something on film inside the bank office here. Now to have an open air ghost town museum just out in Okanagan County all by itself is creepy enough, but to fill it with mannequins and dolls is a whole new level of creep factor. So if you find yourself in the area, really, I encourage you guys to check it out. Um, like I said, it's, it's still the old Western town that it always was. Um, Okanagan County, with the courthouse pictured here, really has some beautiful structures in it. And to see some of these old time mining industry places out there is really lucky. 
Like I said, though, there is a high level of sort of fear factor that goes with the area, and it goes even farther back in the Molson period, back into the 1850s, because right next door to Molson is actually the Fort Colville um, Foundation. And Fort Colville, pictured here, was a U.S. Army post uh, from 1859 to 1882, and nothing of it remains today except this uh, historic marker and the original graveyard there. But the graveyard there that only had 12 to 18 grave plots in it was so heavily plundered over the last 100 years uh, by grave robbers that there's only two or three undisturbed plots today. And all the time that I'm doing research or investigation in this state, people keep bringing up the fact that there is this dark presence in the Fort Colville area. And they describe it usually as the same way as what they experience in the Molson area. Uh, I've got another picture of Molson here because this is the most modern structure in the ghost town of Molson. It's the schoolhouse, which actually operated uh, as a schoolhouse all the way up until 1969. And today is the main body of the museum. Uh, since it's no longer used as a school, uh, Harry Sherling really sort of drove the idea that they could use this structure to house the historic artifacts and the story, not just of Molson, but of Okanagan County as a whole. Um, it is the only part of the Molson ghost town that isn't just open seven days a week. Uh, you do actually have to go during one of the times that they're open, and I encourage you to check their website for that because the world is completely unknowable right now. There's no way to give you <laughs> any answers as to when this will be open or not. Uh, but if you would like to interact with these terrifying mannequins and dolls, you can do so. Uh, you just can't go inside the school right now unless you arrange that early on. Now, not far away from the town of Molson is another ghost town in Northern Washington in Okanagan County, Bodie. Bodie Washington uh, was founded in 1869 with the discovery of gold in the area. And from 1902 until 1911, the mo mines were owned by the Bodie Mining Company, which was essentially owned by the Wrigley brothers of Wrigley's Gum. Because uh, you got to bankroll your sweets habit somehow. And so Bodie just exploded. It had a saloon, a brothel, uh, a main street with a grocer, a butcher, and everything that people were looking for. But unfortunately, it was uh, sort of on again, off again with the gold production and then was closed officially by a governmental order during World War II when they were consolidating resources. The structures that remain today are on either side of Tarota Creek Road. Uh, and all of these structures that are out there are on private property. So if you're going to visit Bodie, uh, be sure to inquire before you go. Now, this is a picture of the Bodie that most people ask me about. This is Bodie, California, which is probably one of the most famous ghost towns in the United States, but this is not the one that we're talking about. This is the Bodie up in Okanagan County. And we've got a clip of it uh, so that you can see someone actually going through the town of Bodie. Bodie was part of a greater sized mining community known as Republic Washington. In its heyday, it boasted seven hotels, 20 saloons, nine general stores, and a number of brothels, and hundreds and hundreds of settlements. The Bodie Mine has been continuously mined since its discovery in 1897. Production here was paused briefly during World War II during the Government Order L-208 for war production, minerals, and metals. The mine is now currently owned and operated by a company, Geomineral Corporation. There is also currently one live functioning farm just a few miles south of town pictured here. If you guys are interested in all of these clips, I'll be sharing our YouTube collection and catalog of all the people 
uh, who've been out exploring with these because there's a rich resource of people who have got to see a lot of these ghost towns and done some great documenting to them. Because one of the tragedies of these ghost towns is that as people go out and explore them, a lot of the buildings get damaged. So I always encourage people to practice responsible ghost town exploration when you're out here in Washington state. The buildings that remain today are almost entirely dilapidated, but they do still have some of the interesting artifacts from the time inside them. So if you are going to go and explore Bodhi, you do get the opportunity to see a lot of the cool places here, including um, a lot of like tin items, like pomade jars and stuff that are inside the bunkhouse here in Bodhi. Uh, this is a picture of it when it was sort of at its peak, and you can see that it had that main road going through it, and it even had um, telegraph poles uh, running through the town at its, its best time. Unfortunately, everything sort of went sideways for Bodhi, as we mentioned, and today the town is, is nothing close to its former glory. Of ghost towns, however, that have maintained uh, some semblance of people still inside them. One of them up in that Okanagan County is actually the ghost town of Cheesaw. Uh, Cheesaw is actually named after a Chinese immigrant to the area who married an indigenous woman in the area and was the first to settle in the area and incorporate it. Uh, his big stake to the area was that he owned a general store near the mining camps and really had the best reputation for being the guy that you wanted to go to if you needed gear. Uh, it was also uh, sort of the midway point for a lot of people coming through the area on their way to other mining destinations. Today, the town of Chisaw, uh, indicated up here by the little green circle on the map, still maintains a population of people, not very many, but what sets it into the ghost town category is the fact that the majority of the original structures there are still here and just abandoned. So this is a picture from 1900 that was taken and the Barker Hotel was the largest building in the area and that's that two-story building on the far right if you can see there and these historic photos of that original camp out there show what it kind of looked like. And it was, believe it or not, one of the larger encampments out there that grew into a really prosperous town. Uh, unfortunately, of the towns in the area, it had probably the shortest lifespan of only four years. From 1886 to 1890 was really its peak. And then the mines dried up as they had the tendency to do in the area. If you visit Chisa today, it still has a general store, gas station, uh, restaurant, and they are home to, I love this postcard from the 1960s, uh, they are home to the annual Chisa 4th of July Rodeo, though perhaps not this year. Uh, it is something that actually draws a substantial crowd from the area out there. And if you are in central to northern Washington, I encourage you to go check it out. Uh, that and the Lind Combine Demolition Derby in Lind, Washington. Two things that not a lot of people go to, but both are actually really incredible events. So Chisa is in that sort of cluster of ghost towns up there in northern Washington that makes up a really good portion of the area there. And what's so cool about Chisa, in my opinion, is that it has the best collection of false front buildings. As you're exploring the town, a lot of those ones where they would build sort of the gabled slope roof and then put the false storefront on there, you'll see a lot of those still in Chisa today. Uh, as the town dried up, this was all that was really left of it. And so it is a pseudo ghost town and that it still has some people living there, uh, but certainly not as many as a few others. Which brings me to one of my honorable mentions. There are so many towns that I could have talked about in Washington and trying to narrow down the list ended up being a difficult decision. But Roslyn, Washington makes it onto the list because it has, I think, one of the coolest features in the area. And aside from looking super cool, uh, it has the oldest continuously operating bar in the state of Washington. Now its population is approximately 890 today. But when it was founded in 1886 for a coal mining company out there, 
uh, it transitioned into sort of this halfway stop out in the mountains there. So if you're cruising across Interstate 90 today, you can stop over and take a look at Roslyn, Washington. And the thing that I always recommend people to check out is the legendary Brick Saloon. The Brick is the oldest continuously operating bar tavern in the state of Washington and has a 23 foot flowing water spittoon right at the bar there. I'm gonna see if I can hear. <laughs> right at the bar, right at the foot of these stools there is this 23 foot trough that's constantly flowing water there. And it was designed so that as patrons of the bar, miners, loggers, railroad workers came through and would spit their tobacco down into the spittoon, it would just wash it down. It was also infamous for attracting patrons that would relieve themselves right there at the bar after a night of heavy drinking. Well, I'm assuming it was heavy drinking. If you have a urinal right at the bar, it doesn't take much to get you going. Uh, today, it's used for a little more wholesome pastime. The 23-foot spittoon is actually used for an annual boat derby. People make little boxcar boats and they race them down this spittoon uh, for prizes in a local thing that's normally done every April, but again, uh, on hold for this year. But hopefully 2022, you too can go and experience the, the boat derby inside the world's longest spittoon. Also in the basement of the Brick Tavern are the old jail cells for the town of Roslyn, which are still intact down there today. And if you can sweet talk the bartender into letting you down, you can go uh, and experience them there. And if you're really mean to the bartender, you might even be able to allow to spend the night in one of these jail cells still down there. Now, when we're looking at ghost towns that have almost disappeared off the map entirely, I want to talk to you about one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, but before I do, I do want to address a couple of these questions here because, yes, one of the things that makes Roslyn extra special is it was used um, for oh, uh, Northern Exposure. Could almost not remember it for a second. For those of you who don't know, uh, there was a series about a small town in Alaska called Northern Exposure, and it was filmed there in Roslyn, Washington. It's still one of their big claims to fame. So if you find yourself in the area and you go for the spittoon or the boat races, you'll still probably see a lot of Northern Exposure paraphernalia. And for a whole generation, they're like, what on earth are they talking about? But now you know. In central Washington, however, is one of my favorite ghost towns, and there's almost nothing left of it today. But the town of Govan has basically this schoolhouse here. And right in the middle of Washington, it was the, the hub for a long period of time there. It's right off of Highway 2, uh, sort of in between like Wilbur, Elmira, Creston area, uh, all towns that are sort of on the cusp of ghost town themselves. But Govan bit the bullet hard and disappeared um, pretty, pretty quickly into the early 1900s. But in the late 1800s, it was the main source of education for the area. It was also the area rocked by a major tragedy and several crimes. In 1902, the judge in Govan was murdered, massacred with an axe. He and his wife were both killed in their home in the middle of the night. And through the days, no one has ever been able to solve the mystery or even get close to understanding who it could have possibly been. Robbery ended up being deemed the motive for this particular murder, but no one actually figured out what happened to it. Now that was in 1902, but then in 1940s, a mother and son were again mysteriously murdered by axe in the town. And it really sort of cemented the idea that the area had a evilness to it that kept reoccurring out there. One thing we do know about the Govan area definitively is that the best preserved structure is the schoolhouse here. Now this is still able um, to be explored. If you go out there, you do have to sort of get up over that stone ledge there to get inside the building itself. But all sorts of paranormal investigation teams go out to the town of Govan today um, to record 
what's going on out there. But also, interestingly enough, it's a fantastic location for seeing the northern lights. Um, the lack of light pollution out there, you can actually get a really good display of aurora borealis when you're out there. And like I said, it's one of the locations that people hunt for this evil spirit that's responsible, they think, for the slain of Judge Lewis back in 1902. And then again in the 1940s was that mother and child. If you go inside the schoolhouse today, where I believe my great, great grandmother was once the school teacher, fun fact for you all. Uh, again, just be respectful of stuff in there because it's one of only two things left out there from 1889. Um, the other thing is this small home here. There was for a period of time also a post office and a church in the area there, but both have just succumbed to the pressure of time. The area is famous also for this gentleman here. This is Harry Tracy. And Harry Tracy was one of the most infamous outlaws in the country for a period of time there. He ran with Butch Cassidy's Hole in the Wall gang and then eventually was killed not far from Govan. Uh, while he was running away from the authorities, he ended up getting shot in the leg and finding himself in this moment with these two marshals chasing him down. He decided that he was just going to end it himself. So he kills himself uh, behind the rock and then is taken into custody. Fair warning, the next picture is uh, the shot that they took of him after he killed himself. So if you're not interested in that, look away briefly. Uh, but this is the last shot of Harry out there after he committed suicide while being pursued by law enforcement. Now, a lot of people believe that his spirit still lingers in the area and people that talk about going out there sort of searching for that desperado legend and lore say that they feel someone stalking them through the night. Uh, next slide for you guys there. Uh, and particularly here in the schoolhouse in Govan, for some reason, people keep talking about hearing someone uh, whispering the name Harry over and over again. If you're interested in visiting the area, you just have to turn right off of Highway 2 and you have the opportunity to go in and explore it. For me, it reminds me a lot of the sort of forgotten Latin Plath towns out there. And another good one, just a little bit north of Govan, is the town of Wakanda. Not like Wakanda forever, but Wakanda for Washington. Take a look. This is what Google is calling the site of old Wakanda. The town of Wakanda was founded in 1898 as a mining community by three brothers from Wakanda, Illinois. They discovered gold in the area and decided to name the area after their hometown. By 1901, the town's population has swollen over 500 people. It had two hotels, four saloons, a general store, and a post office. At its height, the town had over a thousand residents. But in the early 1900s, the output of the mines declined and they were eventually closed. In 1929, the state built Highway 20 that bypassed the town. And so the bulk of the residents relocated a few miles down the road. However, New Wakanda never really caught on, and by June 2015, even this area was completely abandoned and left. So let's bring ourselves back to Western Washington for a moment. There are some great additional ghost towns, particularly in the Palouse Valley of Washington State that we could do a whole separate thing on, uh, including the ghost town, well, it's almost a ghost town, of Elberton. Uh, this is the church in Elberton, and it's just in that sort of south uh, east corner of Washington State out in the Palouse Valley. But I'm going to save those ones for later. I just want you to know they are at least on our radar. Uh, I want to take us back now to the town of Bordeaux. Bordeaux, I think, is one of the prettier and more densely forested ghost towns in the state of Washington. And it was originally set up as a lumber town. And it has these concrete and brick foundations still left out there. So it gives you a good opportunity to go and explore it. And one of the most recognized structures in there is this one. This is the concrete bank vault for the town of Bordeaux. Uh, Bordeaux 
started as a lumber town and then put themselves out of business. Uh, they were mostly creating lumber for the Northern Pacific Railroad, but they logged everything so extensively in the area that all of those old growth trees were gone within under 10 years and there was nothing left for the people of the town to do. So it was very quickly abandoned. But the area has had this sort of dense, heavy, spooky feeling about it ever since. Uh, and here's a clip of it that you can take a look at. So if you want to see some more of that, you can always check out Max Productions on YouTube. They did the, a full walkthrough of the town of Bordeaux. What's so fascinating to me is the things that are left behind, including the, the lumber mill out there, which has uh, sort of this indentation in it. Let's see if we can take you through it here. Uh, this is the majority of the structure right there. And you can see inside they had places for water to be flowing through so that they could operate the machinery as well. And all of Bordeaux is right on top of this uh, river uh, creek, depends on the water flow, in the area there. When it evaporated, the town, in 1920, uh, it was just left open. And then all of that area was reclaimed by this new growth forest out there. And so it's just like this green labyrinth with a really dense fog that comes in the area out there. These are historic photos of the original trees that they were taking down from Bordeaux back in the early 1900s, but all of these were gone by the 1920s and the last residents left town in 1941. It got so tragic, in fact, that the Northern Pacific Railroad moved their line away from the area uh, and started using different trains altogether. But it was, it was the main area for lumber that was being dragged up uh, primarily for the warehousers back in the early 1900s. This is the peak of Bordeaux, and you can see how extensive the damage was. They took every tree they could possibly find and got rid of it. So there is a level of poetic justice to the fact that now uh, this entire area is one of the greenest and most overgrown of the ghost towns in Washington state. Uh, you don't have to walk very far. If you park next to that bank vault, you can just dip right into the forest and get into this main superstructure here where all of the logging and lumber production was done and go from there. Uh, very few of the structures outside of these couple still remain, but uh, it is definitely one of the more pretty areas out there that you can explore. If you're looking for a ghost town, however, that has a great deal still going on in it, Monte Cristo is top of my list. It's one of the more famous ghost towns in Washington. It's just in Eastern Snohomish County, uh, back here in Western Washington. And it was definitely the mining town in 1889. By 1907, it really hit some hard times, but so many of these wealthy investors had put time and money into creating this spectacular town of Monte Cristo that they thought maybe they could keep the, the luxury going by turning it into sort of a, a resort town. Basically, it was the original copy of Leavenworth. Once the city went bankrupt, they were like, oh man, why don't we bring a bunch of tourists in here? Unfortunately, they didn't have the infrastructure to get people this deep into the mountains just on a whim, so it failed again. They turned it once more into a resort town back in the 1960s, but it didn't have the same appeal and success as a lot of other places. And so now you have this hodgepodge of original 1800 structures decaying in the woods, mixed together with these 1960 bungalow cabins. 
Here's a picture from, I believe, 1903 of the town sort of really hitting its stride and peak two years before it was going to disappear. Uh, the things that truly drove it to the ground were the fact that it had a fire and then a flood. And at that point, they realized there was no way to recover without an influx of cash that just wasn't coming in. So really, by the 1930s, it was completely abandoned. If you explore it today, you have to hike about four miles in from the trailhead. But there are so many of the cool artifacts left behind, uh, including old safes that are still up there, some of the original vehicles, uh, machinery, and equipment for the mines. Monte Cristo is also one of the places that has the most elaborate and undisturbed network of mines still in the area. Again, incredibly dangerous, and I encourage you not to go exploring in them. But uh, the Boston American Mine, the Justice Mine, the Mystery Mine, and the New Discovery Tunnel are all um, gold, coal, or mineral mines that were in the area that haven't caved in and actually maintain a very extensive and well-preserved network down there, uh, full of toxic gases, uh, pitfalls, winds, and death, but still out there in the area. Um, a news crew with some spelunkers and cave divers went through and did a digital recording of a couple of those mine shafts back in, I think, 2010. But I haven't been able to find the footage since it originally aired back in 2010. So if anybody finds it, please let me know. Now, Monte Cristo, aside from having the coolest collection of stuff out there, also has some of the best ghost stories to it. Uh, and most of them focus around the time period pictured here in the 1960s when this turned into a resort town. And a lot of them sort of focus on the Bigfoot legend in Washington there that um, people would be like hanging out, having campfires around their lodges and stuff, and see something that looked like an eight to 10 foot well-built person running through the woods in the back of their cabins. What was super strange about that is that things would go missing from the cabins in the 1960s as well. That while people were sleeping in there, stuff would just be taken out of them. And they thought that they had like a rash of burglaries going through, but they never found anything out there. Uh, there is a large group of investigators to this day that still continue to look at the area for one of the possible locations for Sasquatch um, activity. And they really firmly believe that the Monte Cristo area continues to be visited by something larger than life. One of the large arguments for it there is that a lot of this heavy equipment like the safes or the mining equipment continues to get rearranged up there. Uh, despite the fact that the Park Service has never done anything like that, and all of it would be far too heavy for the normal person to move around. So the legends continue in Monte Cristo today, including around uh, this safe, which I'm sorry that the photo is a little blurry for it there. For me, it wouldn't be a complete experience, though, without talking about perhaps my famous ghost town out here, the town of Clay City. Clay City is just outside of Kapowson, Washington, really tucked back in the dark forests of Western Washington, and you really have to work hard to find it. But I think the legends around Clay City are some of the most spectacular and terrifying. Originally, Clay City, as you may have already guessed from the name, was a city designed to create bricks for the majority of Washington state. In fact, a lot of the famous buildings in Washington, Tacoma, Seattle, uh, including the Red Square at University of Washington have been done with bricks that were fired in Clay City. And at its peak, it had, you know, I think a workforce of a hundred people operating um, several dozen of these kilns, brick kilns out there. And they would take clay from the area, fire it and then send it up on the local rail line with the Northern Pacific Railroad and disperse it throughout the cities in Washington state. The reason that it disappeared is up for debate. Um, sort of during the time when uh, brick became less of a cost-effective substance to use and concrete became more popular, really see a decline in Clay City. But there's also a legend that there was a woman who was murdered because the town believed that she had been practicing some sort of dark art. 
Uh, they went to burn down her home with her inside of it. And instead of her home catching fire, the brick kiln area exploded and a lot of the wooden structures in the area caught fire and people ended up moving away from the area. It's said that her structure is the last remaining building out there in Clay City. And from my multiple trips out there, I can attest to the fact that there is, uh, if you go up the end of this road here, this structure out in the woods, uh, heavily covered in vines, but it still has a brick hearth to it and continues to be the only building that I've been able to find out there past this yellow gate. Here's where it gets weird though. Every time that I've been out there, there's always someone who urges me not to go. There's a bar sort of in the Capowson area where I'll stop with buddies if we're going on our way out there. And people are always like, never, ever, ever, ever go to Clay City. You won't like what you find out there. Uh, one of the accounts I found is that there was a couple that were out there riding their ATV, accidentally drove off a cliff, died in the area, and now vengefully seek the area for someone to help them. What's weird about this is for my personal experience out in Clay City, I can tell you every time you go out there, there is this weird sound that's halfway between an animal growling and the sound of an ATV. And it only ever starts when someone in the group gets scared. I've led multiple trips out there. And as soon as you get out there, if you're with a group that's having a lot of fun, no big deal, like a stick snaps or something, someone in the group gets scared and you'll hear that sound. And it's always as if it's just 50 yards away, no matter where you are. And it happens regardless of, you know, whether there's anyone on the road or not, it's this consistent animal growl ATV sound. Um, there is a guy who ended up going out there as part of a like hazing ceremony. And he has this video footage of when he set up his camp out there. Here's where it gets super weird. He then went on to set up his tent, turn off his light and get ready to spend the night out there and wait for anyone to come out there and mess with him. But he was away from the original group and he felt this like heavy presence, like there was a breath on the back of his neck. So he clicks on his light and there was this intense like fog like vapor just around him, but it was pulsing like someone had been breathing right there. He takes his light and he looks up into the tree and just snaps a shot because he's using his camera flashlight there. Uh, and then as soon as the flash goes off and he sees what he sees, he runs out of there right away. This next picture is the picture that the guy took before he terrifyingly ran out of Clay City. Um, for me and my experience, this is not unfeasible. Uh, Clay City is one of the most terrifying locations I've been to in Washington state. And as a ghost town, I think just has the heaviest sort of feel to it. Like you can go to a place like Molson and it's creepy with all the mannequins, uh, just constantly out there sitting in their homes, walking around, but no place terrifies me more ghost town wise than Clay City here in Washington state. Uh, it is a nature preserve today, so if you are going to explore the area, make sure that you're doing so appropriately. We at Pretty Gritty Tours never endorse breaking and entering. But worth noting, worth noting that it's out there. So with that, this is the, the encapsulation of some of my absolute favorite ghost towns in Washington State. If you guys want more information on how to find these places, please let us know. We're always happy to point people to other resources or help them get out there in the right direction. And again, if you'd like to see the world's largest egg, look no farther than Winlock, Washington. It's right out there. Uh, if you've enjoyed your tour tonight and you would like to show your appreciation, you can always do so by, again, going to the homepage of prettygrittytours.com and clicking our PayPal link to tip your guide. It is my pleasure and privilege to provide these virtual tours for you all. 
in this time when we really can't get out and do anything. So hopefully you'll join us for another one. Uh, coming up are the mystery of Mima Mounds, the virtual history of the McKinley neighborhood in Tacoma, and of course, a tour of Stadium High School in its filming for 10 Things I Hate About You, all within the next two weeks. If you guys have questions, comments, please let me know. I'm always around, always excited to talk about history, ghosts, destinations, and what to do. So until next time, my friends, I'm Chris Stottinger with Pretty Gritty Tours, encouraging you to keep on exploring. Thank you, guys.